Yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Sorry for the sorry for the technical mishaps. You know, it happens. Happens to the best of us. Let, let me just say this. We are in very much experimental mode here. There's going to be a heck of a lot of technical <laughs> difficulties and screens jumping around, all sorts of stuff. Because, yeah, we got a, we got a cool platform that we're using here. I guess, uh, hey, it's 11 o'clock, so I appreciate everyone being here. Let's let's kick this off. And, uh, of course, Passive Income Investing, uh, late to the party. I guess he's out <laughs> doing something where, wherever he is. I'm sure he'll join in uh, due time. But let me start by saying this. It is very, very special to have all of you guys and gals making the time out of your day. We see Cass in the middle of the road somewhere. Um, it's it, it's very special to to have you guys all here in one big spot. And I think the viewers will really appreciate it. The The concept behind this collab is that we all have our own individual presences uh, in the space, whether it be a blog, someone like Dan, uh, YouTube channels, TikToks, a variety of different stuff. Uh, and we all certainly have our differences in investing investment styles and portfolio makeups and the stocks we buy the strategies we partake in and i think it would be super cool to illustrate that throughout this collab why we do what we do why we've chosen it go over our portfolios our holdings the whole shebang and we do of course have some viewer questions we'll kind of allocate that towards the end of this but it's probably going to be a long session so uh you guys make yourself uh, comfy if you need to run out to the bathroom get some water like i'm not gonna hold you guys to staring at the staring at these cameras for for an hour and a bit but uh, i see adrian just popped in here so let's get the the man himself adrian what's you hear up? Us? yeah i hear you man. what's up guys hey welcome, do you have welcome. A, welcome mr passive income is it uh do you have headphones by the way me no i don't think i need yeah. them do i uh it sounds pretty good, good. It, it sounds pretty good sounds on my good. end yeah i got my good my good mic here yeah okay okay <laughs> just making sure we've had some feedback issues but uh yeah we were just kicking things off adrian yeah, no worries. Pleasure. What's up, everyone? Pleasure to have you join us, man. Can we can we rearrange the screens? Because right now both Adrians are next to each other, and this is going to get confusing. We don't we don't like that, right? Hey, How's that? Yeah, right. <laughs> we need space. Yeah, well, there we go. Who do you who, who do you want to sit beside, Adrian? How about yeah, you and Cass to sit up here while Robin in the middle? <laughs> Look, so Brandon's, Brandon's going to abuse his power. Right? He's gonna <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just well, curious. I'm just curious, Adrian. Are are you Italian? Italian background? No, I'm 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 from Romania. Okay, you're Roma you're Romanian. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And my name is Adrian. You're... Yeah, but my anglicized name is Adrian. Yeah. Okay. What cool. is your What did you say your actual name was? Adrian. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. I know it okay, sounds like Peter, but I don't really go Wait. by it because yeah. <laughs> Wait, are you like Romanian gypsy? Or <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, no. I'm uh no. We're not. Well, like, you're, uh, you're getting, getting well, right? the offensive. The Roma no, people no. are like a different ethnic group where yeah, I'm yeah. like old school Dacian. Like Romanians are very native people. We don't really migrate. So like I'm like pure blood. Basically. Oh, like, okay. I'm probably the first Romanian to live outside of my village, really. So um, we don't really you're migrate a whole lot. But, yeah. <laughs> Wow. And Cass, I saw you pointing at the camera there, but you kind of yeah. got... I was going to say, bottom corner, Adrian, are you Italian? Because you sound Italian. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm well, I'm, I was born in born in Canada, but I, I, I speak Italian. I could speak Italian. Gotcha. Well, you know what? This kind of, I think, would kick things off very, very well in that, uh, yeah, we all got our own stories. We all got our own presences. Why don't we just start this collab off with a quick little introduction for our sake and for the viewer's sake, there are a lot of popular names, as I'm sure a lot of viewers will be recognizing some of these folks, but uh, there are also smaller ones as well, and some that kind of hide behind uh, other brands. So why don't we get started with that? Uh, I guess I could kick it off. Uh, Brandon, um, it's being posted on my channel, so hopefully a lot of people uh, know me, but yeah, I've been in the YouTube game for five years now, and it's crazy how fast that, that f time flew by. Like, I remember posting my first video and being all you know anxious and whatnot as, as i'm sure you guys all felt that that same fear uh, originally but it's obviously one of the coolest decisions i've ever made and being able to talk about investment stocks sharing what i do in the stock market since i've been investing since i was a young kid uh, it's super cool and that's kind of my background uh, i can kick it over to i guess in order canadian a t-shirt sure free to introduce. Uh, how so like a, like a quick like 90 second two minute thing yeah how about it sure. man Okay. All right. Sounds good. So Brandon, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for hosting this. I mean, Brandon was one of my inspirations for starting the YouTube channel. I was, well, I've been a fan of Brandon's for years. Um, I remember when I was probably at around probably like, I might've had like 250 subscribers 
and and I know I got the notification that Brandon subs- subscribed to me, and he reached out to me on Instagram, and I I had such like a fanboy moment. I was like, holy shit, Brandon Beavis knows who I am, right? And now here we are, like collaborating. So it's uh it's been a hell of a journey. Um, give me a quick, I guess a quick quick intro about my journey. Uh, I wasn't ever really in the finance world. Like I studied mathematical physics. I was a software AI engineer for almost ten years, but I always um ran multiple side businesses because I always knew the benefit of like the tax efficiency of running a business, uh, how, you know, you could bust your ass, sorry, you could work your butt off, um, working at a job, trying to get a promotion, trying to get a bonus. And that's great. You get a pat on the back and you might get a little bit of a bonus, but you pay 30, 40, 50% in taxes, right? Whereas if you make the same amount of effort into your own business or into your investments, you keep a much larger share of that. Plus you can make money in your sleep, right? So that was kind of a wake up call for me to really, focus on entrepreneurial endeavors and investments, right? Um, And then the reason why I started my YouTube channel, it it started as a hobby for me. Um, I actually, at my old job, I actually uh, was responsible for managing multiple teams and I hired, you know, dozens of co-op students every semester. And something I like to do was do lunch and learn sessions where every week, uh, every Thursday at lunch, I would teach them skills like resume building, interview skills, that kind of thing. But a big thing that the students really gravitate towards was my financial lessons. I would teach them about how taxes work, how investing works, how credit cards work. And these students were like amazed. Like they never even heard these things. Like their eyes were like wide open. And Mm. I realized I'm kind of making the same speech again and again with each batch of new students. So I decided, hey, why not, you know, kind of make these in video format, right? And put them on YouTube and see if they, see if anyone watches. And, you know, like Brandon said, at first I was very nervous. I was, you can go back, see my oldest videos. They were, they're rough. The audio quality is crap. The video quality is crap. I was just using like an Ikea lamp and my cell phone. Um, but, you know, slowly with enough engagement with the audience, uh, you kind of build some traction. And my hobby eventually became my career. And now I am a full time YouTuber. Right. I don't even write code anymore. I haven't touched code in over a year now. So it's been an exciting journey, an unexpected journey. But that's that's life. Right. That's that's life for anyone. If you, I was lucky enough to find something I'm passionate about and turn my passion into a career, even though it was a complete 180 from the previous 10 years of my life. So that's kind of my just, short story. I'll just say, Adrian, too, we've been all following along with your stuff and recently you had a couple of videos pop off and the channel's really gaining some steam and it's really well-deserved. Thank um, you, you, thank know, you. The, the work that. you put in, I'm sure you know that you're replying to all the comments and you have a very, very strong community for a very good reason. So I wanna say congrats on that. Thank Cass, you, it, yeah, you kick it off to you. Okay, my name is Cass, guys, or Cassandra. I'm a nurse based here in Toronto. I've been a nurse for almost four years now, and I actually have no, like I said, I went to nursing school. I have zero financial background or investing background. No one in my family is in the finance space, so I learned it all kind of just being self-taught, reading books. Like Rich Dad Poor Dad was my first gateway drug book into personal finance, for example. Mm-hmm. And then just read a bunch of blogs, YouTube videos, uh, and just a lot of self-education on my part. And then I started investing about three-ish years ago. So about so once I started, once I was like looking for nursing jobs, I was that was also when I started doing personal finance and self education. And then I started posting on TikTok about maybe two-ish years ago, and then it kind of blew up from there. And one of my videos went viral within the per, the first maybe week or two of posting. And then I just kind of decided like let me share this information. And you know I happen to teach myself, and I really feel like I can empower people hopefully to teach themselves about personal finance and investing as well. I want to show people that you don't have to be in, in finance or in business to learn how to invest and to mm-hmm. empower yourself with, you know, saving money for retirement and investing. And so hopefully people can resonate with my story in that way that you don't have to be involved in business or finance at all uh, to start investing. So that pretty much sums it up. So I've been investing for about three ish years now. Yeah. I think what's really cool, Cass and guys feel free to jump in if you'd like, but uh, you know, at least if you look at my analytics, and I'm sure this is the case across a lot of the the creators here, you know, the, the investment space is so like male dominated, like it's 80% if so. And it's very cool. Like, I think it's a very special thing that even in this collab, we're able to showcase some females in the space. Because like you said, I, I do, I, I certainly understand that there's a lot of females out there who maybe feel underrepresented and under, um, not that they may not want to follow us and hopefully they do. But uh, they, there's, it hits home a little bit different when it's coming from a female perspective. So I think you, Shay, I, it is super cool to have you guys uh, doing what you do. And uh, it's just a little call up that I would, would throw in there. Yeah, and 70% of my TikTok audience is female. So 
I feel like, you know, girls resonate with me and that makes me super happy because traditionally you're correct, Brandon, it is more male dominated. And like, I don't make being a girl investor, like my personality or anything. I just happen mm. to be a girl doing this. And I think people resonate with that. And uh, yeah, I just want people in general, everybody, no matter who you are, I just feel like you should learn how to invest and just, it'll make your life so much better in the, in the long term. So that concludes my little intro. Absolutely. Well <laughs> Dan, I would say, I would say it's actually more like 95% male. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's, uh, <clears throat> no, it's nice to see that happening. Like there's, there is, it's male dominated for sure. And a lot of, like, you know, a lot of popular female influencers and they have large female audiences because a lot don't feel, you know, that they can come to mm-hmm. this type of space and get, you know, so yeah, it's good. Um, I'm Dan from Stock Trades. Uh, we are on YouTube, but we're more of a traditional based blog. Uh, we started it in 2016. It was just a hobby of uh, my friend and I, and eventually it just kind of exploded to the point where we're probably one of the bigger financial websites in Canada now, uh, pretty much directly competing with the Molly Fool. Um, I've been a self-directed investor since probably 2009. I think I made my first deposit probably 13, 14 years ago. Um, what else? Uh, we started stock trades premium, kind of a research platform in 2018, again, to just provide, you know, in-depth research to Canadians, um, just, you know, completely transparent, objective, uh, investment, not advice, but, you know, guidance for those who are either new or whether they've been in the market for, you know, 20 years, whether they've been in the market for six months. Um, Mm -hmm. it kind of evolved from, you know, just a straight, stock picking service when we started to more of like a broad based educational platform. Like a lot of people come to us for, uh, just, you know, generic advice on stocks, uh, fixed income ETFs, even stuff like annuities, uh, market link GICs, like everybody, you know, there's a whole ton of resources we cover and, uh, our YouTube, you know, we're getting a little bit more on YouTube these days. We only started our channel in 2020 after, you know, kind of establishing that web-based audience. We're kind of, you know, we saw the trend towards more video content. So we kind of provide exclusive Canadian research on our YouTube channel, although we're looking to kind of expand into the the US market as well. But yeah, that's about it for me. There's there's myself and there's Matt. Uh, Dylan, me and Dylan started the website. Dylan's more on the marketing end of things, but Matt, I don't know if you guys have seen him in the YouTube videos. He's got a ton of experience. He's been investing I think since the nineties, it's been around for a while. So yeah, he trumps my experience, but yeah. I'll, I'll say that. Me. Sorry, Dan, sorry to cut you off. I was going to say, I mean, anytime you go Google, like, Oh, Canadian stocks to buy or any sort of dividend stocks, Canada, you guys are the, like the first hit. So you guys are doing well with the Google, uh, you know, SEO on that part. I mean, clearly that's, that's your realm. And yeah, for those that are not too familiar with, you know, maybe the face, you know, the stock trades blog, like you said, is a, is a big, big player in the Canadian scene. And your premium service is something I've subscribed to for over two years now and our students love it. So uh, a big advocate of that as well, but very nice to have you here as well, Dan. Robin. Sure. So uh, uh, I own a YouTube channel called Robin, uh, Robin Haney. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Uh, I think 2020 was when I started there and uh, my background isn't really super special. So um, I'm 32 years old. And when I, in my early twenties, I didn't do a, heck of a lot i wasted a lot of time i didn't get into any trouble but i didn't really go anywhere like i didn't really i worked like more part-time jobs didn't really make a lot of money i always wanted to run my own business and kind of do something different i just didn't know what it was so kind of as i got older and um i hit more like you know my late 20s um i tried a bunch of different things some things worked some things didn't but it kind of opened my mind up to the idea of passive income because i was doing some things that kind of got me that passive income, so to speak, wasn't fully passive, but I got a taste of like, you know, there's a better way of doing things than going to a job every single day and working, you know, nine to five kind of thing. I could make money while I sleep kind of thing. So that caused me to look at first, I started with savings accounts and then it was like GICs and stuff. And then it was like investing. And then that's when like the light bulb for me really went off because it gave me an opportunity to kind of get ahead, but also kind of live the lifestyle I wanted kind of thing. Um, and I'll, I'll just say, like, it doesn't matter your background. Like, um, I come from, I didn't go to college, I didn't go to university, and I'm still having pretty good success. I had to kind of, you know, make up for a little bit there. But I honestly, like, investing and 
dividend investing and all that kind of stuff really made a big difference in my life. And if I didn't have that, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be tough. Like I'd still be kind of back where I was spinning my wheels kind of, especially nowadays where, you know, everything's so expensive and, you know, be just freaking out about stuff. So it, it definitely was a big thing for me and definitely uh, it's just more of a, you know, a regular person, I would say. I'm, uh, it definitely yeah. helps me out kind of thing for sure. That's, that's cool to hear, Robin. And what I'm kind of picking up is, you know, we have such a variety of, of personality here, you know, a lot of people, for sure. you know, let's, let's say you want to call yourself a quote unquote average person, average guy, average girl. Um, and then you have people who have been investing for longer. That's, I guess, the fun part about YouTube is you get all these different backgrounds and you don't have to watch a certain person. You pick who you resonate with. So that is really cool to hear, Robin. Um, uh, I Riley, just want to mention really quick that before we go to the next person, um, uh, I know Adrian talked about watching your stuff. It, it was super, it's actually pretty crazy to be here talking with all you guys. Cause I know multiple, all, a lot of you guys, like I remember looking at your content, seeing your stuff and to be here with everybody kind of doing this thing is super cool. Good to have you here, Robin. <laughs> Riley, let's send it over to you. Okay, right on. Um, so, hey guys, I'm Riley, or uh, on YouTube, I'm known as Canadian Dividend Investing. I'm kind of that uh, person you probably have never seen my face before, because uh, I've actually never showed it on YouTube. Um, and that's actually the one fun fact. I know Brandon asked us to do a one fun fact. Fun I did, fact that's that, why I forgot about the fun fact. That's okay, that's okay. I got a fun <laughs> fact for you. I've never showed my face on YouTube, so this is the first time <laughs> I'm kind of putting myself out there. And uh, there's going to be more of me you know, on my channel moving forward, so... I just wanted to kind of introduce uh, myself to you guys, as well as the uh, Blossom community and YouTube channel. Um, I've been investing for about two years. Uh, when I started making money, I made it a point to start investing my money. Um, I created a YouTube channel to kind of hold myself accountable, uh, as I'm sure a bunch of you do as well. Um, but holding myself accountable as well as kind of helping other people who are in kind of the same position as I was. Um, or I currently am. Uh, yeah. On my channel, I kind of create videos every Monday and Friday, um, which kind of ties into what Blossom, you guys are doing with Blossom, which is absolutely incredible, is that I'm super transparent with what I'm investing with, uh, as you guys are as well. Uh, but I kind of show my stock picks, I show my portfolio, what I'm investing in, and hopefully can help someone out there as well. Um, I kind of do what's called like a well simple trade challenge, the platform that I use, and I kind of dollar cost average on a weekly basis and just show the stock pickings that I choose. Um, obviously, one of the smaller channels here, uh, I'm on TikTok and YouTube. But uh, again, as the ladder goes down, uh, I just want to give a shout out to the rest of you guys, especially Brandon, Canadian and T-shirt, Robin Haney. I was watching you guys and you guys kind of inspired me to to create a YouTube channel myself, as well as the rest of the creators as well. Um, but apart from that, yeah, the fun fact is I've never showed myself on uh, on YouTube before. So <laughs> super happy to be uh, uh, picked to be on this team and uh, and awesome working with you guys. Can't wait for uh, the future of Blossom. Absolutely. If, if Shay, I could jump in, I, I do have to say one thing though, Riley. I'm a little disappointed that you didn't come dressed as the Monopoly man. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to grab my costume. We'll, uh, there you we'll go. I might have a fun fact for later. No. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just going to ask, uh, Riley, are you the guy that always posts nice comments on my videos? So now, now <laughs> I, I remember that Monopoly thing. So Put that a name is to you. A face, so yeah. I appreciate no, that, by the way. And, uh, uh, but by, by the way, in case you didn't know, you, you have a pretty face. You should show it on your YouTube. Agreed. I agree. I appreciate it. Thank, sure, you, thank, sure. you, thank you. You have a good. You have the good voice, though. You, you have the really good voice for it. But you should show your face. You're a good-looking dude. I appreciate Agreed. it, man. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shay. Uh, on YouTube, I'm humble trader. Uh, I talk about mostly day trading and swing trading. Um, I almost never talk about investing, but I definitely still invest personally. Uh, fun fact about me is that I used to be a VFX designer in film. So that was a while ago when I used to have like my regular full-time job. Um, and then I quit to become a day trader full-time, but that's why creating videos, content, editing, uh, writing scripts that came naturally to me. Uh, and that's why, you know, it was like a fun little side hustle uh, uh, to, for me to start like the YouTube channel. Uh, I wanted to start it to kind of showcase some of the, the, to track my own progress as a day trader at the time. And also to kind of provide some uh, of my own strategies out there and just to, just to kind of spread the word of how, what the reality of day trading, because it's a, it's a uh, day trading is the hardest way to make easy money. 
Um, so yeah, so that's my story. And I'm really happy to be here with everyone, the rest of the Canadian YouTubers in the investing space. Uh, and uh, yeah, I also, I'm really happy to be on the Blossom influencer team as well. Bilal? Hey, what's up guys? Uh, Canadian stocks on uh, Instagram and TikTok. That's kind of where I uh, blew up on and uh, kind of started that during 2020, during the pandemic, because, you know, everyone was bored. And uh, I started investing five, seven, I mean, uh, six, seven years ago, but I started off doing that, doing it with um, Walt Simple self-investing. So, and then uh, kind of got, I picked up that book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he started talking about dividends. And I was like, hey, I like making money while I sleep. So, you know, I kind of looked into picking stocks by myself and that's when Walt Simple Trade was there. And then, yeah, I just got addicted as money, as much as you guys, you know, when you guys start seeing dividends coming, coming and you see that notification. And yeah, so uh, that's when I also started uh, my YouTube channel. But I started off doing that by posting travel videos because uh, I like to travel a lot. And if you check out BD Investing on the YouTube, uh, you will see a lot of like YouTube videos on traveling. And I do a lot of uh, reviews on resorts and countries I visit. And with the investing side, uh, it's mostly beginner videos right now, but I'm trying. I also post videos on dividend investing and growth investing. But yeah, that's pretty much it. And I'm trying to learn a lot from you guys too. And you guys are doing a great job on YouTube and Blossom too. So I'm just glad to be here. And you do some options and some some swing trading on the side as well. I know I know what you're doing. <laughs> here. Don't, don't not- forget to leave that out. I'm not trying to trying to be a degenerate, you know, but yeah, I do do I do options trading, but uh, I'm not really trying to teach it. A lot of people ask me to teach it. Be but fair. I don't want to be, you know, held liable because it is very risky, <laughs> but uh, it is fun. I like it. And uh, Shay was right. You know, uh, day trading is very hard. It's very hard to even make a hundred bucks a day. Mm-hmm. But, you know, maybe once I get better and I get some traction on that YouTube channel, I think Walt Simple just released some stuff about options. So mm-hmm. I was thinking about releasing a video on that, how to use options on what's simple. But yeah, guys, stay tuned and we'll see what, what goes on for my YouTube channel. Absolutely. And last but not least, we have Adrian. And then we can actually get into the, the meats and potatoes of this video, which uh, I guess some people might be here for. But Adrian, nice to have you here. Yeah, I'll make it quick, guys. You, pro- you guys probably already know most of this. My name's Adrian. I'm 37. I think I'm the oldest out of all of you. Uh, I have no financial background whatsoever either. I worked, my wife and I worked in the IT field our whole career, pretty successful career, not in the technical side, more the managerial side, but investing for fun in starting in 2012 to about 2018, we, you know, it was just swing trading. Basically now I know what it is, you know, Blackberry and and stuff like that. Eventually fell in love with dividends, uh, dividend stocks and the idea of passive income. I saw Kevin O'Leary's interview and that changed everything. Uh, You know, he's talking about dividend stocks and all that. I'm sure you guys have seen that. Um, so once the more our mortgage was paid, basically we were at a crossroads. What the hell do we do now with all this disposable income? So that's when I did a deep dive research and discovered uh, a lot of the income oriented stuff I talk about now went all in and, uh, you know, my wife retired, uh, shortly after that, I retired a year later, started the channel in 2020, right after COVID or during COVID, just cause we were home, we were bored. But the main reason we started the channel is because everyone was just perplexed on how we became financially independent at such a young age. My wife's friends were all freaking out, asking her, what the hell are you, are you doing or whatever. So we said, instead of explaining it every time, let's create a YouTube channel. I'll do some videos. And since my wife you know, had more time on her hands, we'd, we'd do the editing and stuff like that. And... Uh, eventually, I quit about a year later to focus on this because it started gaining pop, uh, you know, popularity, and uh, that's all she wrote. Very cool. And what time is it there for you right now? Uh, so a lot of people think like, well, what time is it? It's the same. It's Eastern time. Oh. So it, it's pretty much Eastern time, except when Canada changes the hour, we're going to be an hour behind. So th- it's basically Eastern time, but they have no hour change here. In, in Wait, what's that? You live in Panama, right? Yeah. When did you move there? So, I'm sorry. When did you move to Panama? Uh, About seven months ago, in 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 June of last year. And you're gonna continue to stay there? Enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm permanent resident. Yeah. Oh, sick! I I went Panama. I think last last year was very. It's actually very. It's a very great uh, country, man. It's 
pretty much like uh, it's very modern. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's why we were attracted to it. Very modern. Uh, we're about an hour, an hour and a half away from Panama City. We're in Coronado, uh, which is kind of like, think of the Hamptons to New York. It's kind of like the, the beach town for a lot of expats come here. They snowbird here, but it's also where, uh, you know, like the rich Panamanians. A lot of, a lot of small, yeah, a lot of small businesses there too. I mean, uh, a lot of. Yeah, there is a lot of restaurants and yeah. a lot of expats come here to open small businesses to cater to the expats, which yeah. is funny. Uh, Cause it's very, very busy, uh, very business friendly country. Uh -huh. So a lot my, of, uh, my aunt uh, actually owns a restaurant there. I'll, I'll send you a message to, you know, maybe you can go visit there. She, it's like, it, a, it's like a little a Indian called? Panamanian called Guri's cafe. Is it in Coronado and, or in the city? No, it's in the, it's in the Panama city. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like a Panamanian Indian kind of uh, mixture. And it's, it's actually a great fusion of food. Yeah, that's that sounds, cool, man. Yeah, a lot of delicious. restaurants here. It's very modern, Panama City. It's like yeah. it's like Montreal, basically. So uh, we have the city an hour away in case we miss it. But yeah, I'm here. I'm just living on the beach, chilling, working. And uh, it's I can't complain so far. I mean, it's 33 degrees, so I'm that's not going to complain. Man. That's gold, yo. That's yeah. the life, man. I can see it. I don't know if it's my camera, but it looks like you got like, a nice little sun exposure just probably year round so <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean like, <laughs> like if i turn my camera around like that's the no. balcony and the ocean's right there so it's it's pretty cool it's pretty special that's the life man well no thanks for sharing adrian and uh yeah sure. why don't we why don't we kind of kick things off here guys we're already about 30 minutes into this uh collaboration so i'll probably keep mine short but the concept behind this is that we want to kind of showcase the various invest investment styles and portfolios and we have these little screen screen grabs, which may help support. If you guys have to zoom in, zoom in. Maybe we can just look really closely. But basically, have a little pie chart on the right of our account of our overall pie chart, if you will, and then broken down to the individual holdings. And I'll just say for me, um, my portfolio. If I look at it right now, what do I give it as a rating? I don't love it. Okay, it's not. Uh, I wouldn't say the best portfolio in the world. It certainly isn't uh, one that I would recommend people uh, follow. In fact, I would never recommend people follow someone else. Um, they always have to find a portfolio that works themselves. But uh, I very much consider myself a hybrid investor. Uh, I have a total of thirty holdings in this account. My my RSP actually isn't included here, which does skew these. Um, as you'll see, my top few uh, holdings sit in uh, three very risky stocks, in my opinion. Three stocks that carry uh, quite a bit of uh, risk. In uh, that being ten cent at ten percent, uh, Meta has you know had a nice little bounce so that's climbed up, and then Baba, obviously that's been a, a bit of a drag on my portfolio. But those three stocks aside, which you know to me is it, it was a bigger bet that I placed. I am very proud of the rest of the portfolio, and you'll see a lot of the big blue chip names, the, the TDs, the Googles, uh, BlackRock, uh, Kushtard, a variety of other holdings that uh, you know these are the ones that I can sleep pretty well with. Being a younger investor myself, uh, and I talk about this on the channel like all the time, uh, making that decision to put a heavier weight on on international stocks, Chinese stocks in particular, is something that hasn't paid off for me quite yet. But I haven't crossed that out uh, in terms of the long term plan. I am actually more optimistic than a lot of folks in the space uh, for a variety of reasons, and I think that it's it's too early to to tell you know these this portfolio that you're looking at was built actually within the past year or two so last i checked i was down about uh, i think seven or eight percent on this account this is my margin account and a bit of my tfsa my story like i ended up selling my tfsa to, to purchase a down uh, down payment for my home i rebuilt it up pretty much right when the market started taking a tank and that's okay that's like you know that's that's life as an investor that's something i don't um fear or or try to avoid obviously you try to avoid it but it's something I live with. And case in point being is that these top few positions definitely make the portfolio aggressive, but it is within my risk appetite. And I am still optimistic for the long-term future of, uh, believe it or not, all three of these holds. I will say, um, I don't know if you guys saw like uh, Warren Buffett just sold out of his uh, Taiwan Semiconductor stake, uh, or at least pr trim profits. I saw that literally this week. And uh, I'll say this. I always like to read between the lines and do a little bit of digging. And, you know, I think people like Warren and these super investors, they, they have intel and insights um, far beyond what we would ever have. And I think back to like the COVID pandemic, when you bought into the airlines, you guys recall that you bought into a bunch of airlines, I believe it was, and then ended up selling them for a loss. And I mean, maybe he um, initially underestimated the, the potential, uh, you know, the, the weight of the COVID pandemic. And then for whatever reason was able to understand how serious it was and then sold at a loss. 
I wonder, that's crossing my mind, is he, uh, is he onto something right now um, about maybe the geopolitical environment that uh, things could be getting worse? I, I can't speculate, but that does, that's the risk that comes with my, uh, my portfolio. So yeah, the, thinks, just sorry, who's talking? Well, okay, go ahead. Just Dan. a comment on the airlines. He pretty much had to sell out because they were getting a bailout. Mm. You can't have, you know, one of the richest men in the world owning a big mm. chunk of your airline and then getting government money. It just, that's like, I mean, that's still a little bit of speculation, but I would say that's, that's almost guaranteed why he sold out. He's worth too much. And the government, like, you know, they wouldn't have given him that money if they would have went to Buffett and been like, get money from your shareholders before you get a government bailout. Right. So I think that's why he bailed out on them. Mm. And hey, I would, uh, hey, I wouldn't argue with you there, Dan, your, your reasoning behind any of the stock picks you share uh, and the backing is there is backing there and there's reasoning and you certainly know what you're talking about when it comes to uh, individual stocks and everything you offer. So I do agree with that, but Hey, that's my portfolio. I'm happy to send it over to the next. Um, let's see what order we have this in um, just in lieu of time. But like I said, feel free to screenshot that guys. This is all over on blossom, which is obviously going to be linked down below. Next up, Adrian, okay. take it away. Awesome. Thanks guys. I mean, just to jump in about what you mentioned about Warren Buffett and something you said at the beginning, Brandon, you never want anyone to copy you. Right. And I'm sure all of us here agree. We love, we, we idolize Warren Buffett. Like we read his books. I quote him personally on my channel many times, right? Some of his quotes, like, you know, if you don't make money in your sleep, you'll, you'll work until you die. That's one of my life kind of mantras, right? That being said, you should never blindly copy anyone, including someone that we respect to the max, like Warren Buffett, because let's face it, we are in a very different situation, right? He's 92 mm -hmm. years old. And when he buys or sells the stocks, he has a huge amount of influence on the market, right? When you and I buy and sell the stocks, we, it, it doesn't matter at all. It's a drop in the bucket, right? So that's why I, I think I, you, should, you should, you know, the way our audience looks at us and we always tell them don't blindly copy what we do. We also look at, look at, at, the, at the big players, right? And, we, we, and we, should always, we should always be cognizant of that, right? We are not... Even though Warren Buffett may be doing something, it's good to understand his reasoning, but don't just blindly copy it because Warren's doing it, right? Of course. Okay, so I guess I'll jump into uh, my portfolio. So yeah, here I am Canadian in a t-shirt. And I think uh, my pie chart will look quite different from you guys uh, because I have so many holdings. So uh, the vast majority, almost like 70% of my pie chart is in the other category. Um and that's just because I am, I, I'm, I, I believe in being uh, very diversified. Um, one thing I will note, kind of like Brandon, is that this is not my entire portfolio. On Blossom right now, I am only showing my TFSA and RRSP portfolio. And that's through various brokers, through mainly Quest Trade, TD Direct Investing, and Wealth Simple Trade. Um, in my margin account, which I haven't revealed yet, but I am planning on revealing my margin portfolio probably in the next month or two. Uh, I want to do that as an exclusive event for my members, uh, my membership page first before I move it to Blossom. My margin account is where I hold more of the growth um, focused investments, a lot of the tech stocks, a lot of the growth um, uh, ETFs, international ETFs, right? So, so right now, what you see right now in Blossom, it's definitely much more dividend, uh, dividend focused, dividend. Mm. I would say dip, pure dividends and dividend growth focused. Um, so. And that's be and there's a variety of reasons. I talked about that on my channel many times, but basically my strategy is for my TFSA and RRSP, I really want to make the most of the tax shelter benefits, right? Um, and I do intend, and I, I always try to max out my TFSA and RRSP every single year. And once those, those tax sheltered accounts are maxed out, you have to pay taxes, right? In a non-registered account. So if you're going to pay taxes on something, you might as well pay taxes on the most tax efficient forms of investments, which generally speaking are capital gains and Canadian eligible dividends because they have that Canadian dividend tax credit. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to dive too much into taxation, but my, my general strategy is the things that are uh, growth stocks, capital gains, and Canadian dividends, I focus a lot of those in my margin account, which you won't see here right now. In my TFSA and RRSP, I want to focus on the things that are taxed a little bit more heavier uh, to get, you know, so if I could avoid taxes on these heavier uh, more tax inefficient investments, it saves me a lot of money in the long run. So that's why you'll notice in my RSP, that's where I only hold my US dividends. So that's, you know, I avoid that 15% withholding tax on US dividends. And in my TFC and RSP, I have a very uh, strong focus on uh, the anything that's like considered an ineligible dividend. So like a US dividend or foreign dividend, or more specifically a REIT, right? Because mm -hmm. REITs, real estate, real estate investment trusts, they don't pay out 
regular dividends. They pay out distributions, which are taxed. The, the tax structure does vary between REITs because that it, that distribution is made up of various forms of income, return of capital, rent, interest, blah, 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 right? And uh, But the main idea there is when, when you receive a dividend or a distribution from a REIT, it's not the same as when you receive an eligible dividend from a Canadian company like TD or Enbridge, right? Yeah. Canadian dividends are taxed much more favorably. REITs are taxed much higher and it's a much more complicated tax structure, right? So it's more work when you file your taxes. That's why for me, I only hold REITs in my TFSA and RSP. I don't hold any REITs in my, in my non-registered accounts. So that's why right now, what you see here might be a little bit skewed from my overall full portfolio because you have, you, you'll see a very, very heavy focus on REITs. Uh, a lot of REITs you'll notice here, things like uh, Rio Can, uh, Smart Centers, Iron Mountain, Plaza REIT, uh, First Canadian REIT, H&R REIT. Um, you know, so it's, 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 I, I, I definitely, I'm definitely a big proponent of REITs. I, I believe in real estate investing for many reasons, both on the physical real estate, like owning a rental property, but also through REITs because you can able, you're able to tap into the real estate market without needing, you know, 50 grand or hundred grand for a down payment. Um, I'm not, I always tell people like, you know, don't blindly copy what I do because you don't want to have too much REIT or real estate exposure because like what we're seeing right now, when interest rates go up, real estate is, is hit particularly hard, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's just one thing I definitely want to point out, right? Uh, I have a strong focus on REITs mainly because I want to make sure I want to benefit from that tax efficiency, but you also want to diversify across other sectors. So, and you'll notice I have, I have a pretty broad diversification. I have a lot of ETFs, which track, you know, a lot of the indexes across the US side and the Canadian side, but then I'll also have a lot of focus on um, blue chip established Canadian and US stocks. Uh, a lot of dividend aristocrats, even some dividend kings, uh, things like Coca-Cola, Procter & Gamble. A dividend kings basically meaning a company that has increased their dividend for 50 years or more, right? In Canada right now, we have two stocks that are about to become dividend kings, Fortis and Canadian Utilities. In about a two, probably a year or two, we're going to get, they're going to reach that dividend king status. So I'm excited for that. Um, but, but a lot of my holdings are pretty similar to Brandon. Um, I don't have those aggressive international stocks. And again, those kind of things I would hold more in my non-registered account, which I don't show here. But uh, I do hold a lot of those, you know, established Canadian companies, U.S. companies as well. The TDs, the Enbridges, the Manulifes, uh, what else? Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble. Basically, I'm not trying to, you know, find the, the needle in the haystack. I'm not trying to find the company that's going to, you know, 10x in a month, right? I want um, really kind of reasonable and, and sustainable companies, companies that have been around for decades or even 100 years, companies that have paid dividends for 100 years, something like, you know, I, this is a fact I always use all the time. TD has never missed a dividend payment in 165 years, right? Even through the World Wars, Great Depression, you name it, 2008, 2020, TD will always pay a dividend. That's why I like to invest in a company like that. They are always profitable. They're always in demand. They're always growing. They've been around for almost two, they're, they're older than Canada as a nation, and they're going to be around for another 100 years. Those are the companies I want to own. Those are the companies I want to keep. I'm not trying to, you know, outsmart the market. I'm just basically investing in the market. And that's kind of my, 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 my mantra, right? I'm not trying to time the market. I'm not trying to outsmart anyone. I just want to hold on to quality, reliable stocks, stocks that I'm proud to own and hold on to them for life. That's my strategy. Very fair. Any thoughts there from anybody? Just one thing. Uh, Canadian Utilities is a dividend king. I believe oh, it, as it, it of this year, I think, yeah. This year? Yeah. Er, Fortis, awesome. Fortis next year. That's awesome. Okay. Well yeah. done. Fortis should be, will be next year. Next year. Got, right, right. Adrian, yeah, you got third. One, mi one minor Structure. thing about the REITs and the tax efficiency or eligible dividends. I would say that for um, people in higher tax brackets, capital gains, uh, like after 100K or something like that, typically is better taxed than sure, eligible sure. dividends. It depends yeah. on your province, your, your tax bracket, but a lot of REITs or uh, REIT ETFs give a lot of capital gains income, which is uh, for people in higher tax brackets is, is taxed really well. And yeah, I, I'm a big fan of REITs as well. I typically don't REIT pick. I just have one fund uh, that has a bunch of REITs together, but just wanted to point that out. Well, we can move it. We can move into that, Adrian, Adriano, because I believe you're next up here. And sure. Yeah, feel free to elaborate on, on exactly that. Yeah, okay. Well, this is my uh, combination of my TFSA, my wife's TFSA, and our non-registered. RSPs are not in here. Uh, I figure, you know, Blossom, 
Canadian investors. I hold mostly U.S. stuff or U.S. listed stuff in the RSP, so I excluded them from Blossom. Um, but you know, the combination of our two TFSAs and cash uh, cash account or non-reg is really uh, designed to be my eternal paycheck. That's how I see it. It's it's my cash cow. It's basically replaced our our income, right? So uh, I, I pretty much have a very very similar routine month to month. Um, I get all my dividends and uh, whatever, you know, I pay all my bills, whatever's left over, I, I reinvest. So I typically invest every single month, dollar cost average. Whenever I'm buying anything, my intention is always to buy and hold it forever. I, I consider myself a really long term, if not forever term, income oriented investing. So all my holdings, they're really the primary focus is the income. And the bread and butter of the strategy is really a covered calls, leverage, most of the time, a combination of the two. The idea behind that is if you're going to own, well, behind the leverage part anyway, because a lot of people, it scares people. They don't really understand what it is. Uh, if you're going to, my opinion here, of course, uh, like Adrian said, you know, you shouldn't copy anyone. You should do your own research. Agree with that 100%. Uh, but in my opinion, if you're going to hold something long term, you intend to hold it forever. I think it's a great idea to add uh, some leverage on it. And I'm not talking about you taking margin or you taking leverage. These funds are already leveraged. So either uh, synthetically leveraged, th those are the split funds, which I'm not going to get into because it's probably going to be an hour. Uh, but then there's regular leverage, for example, the HYLD, the HDIF, HDIF. Um, BMAX as well. They all use about 25% cash leverage. So that in enhances your yield. So a lot of these holdings are are giving me, you know, my, my average portfolio yield as of now is about 10.9. So my intention is really to live off the passive income, not worry about when to sell anything. Uh, so these are all pretty much income oriented funds that hold very high quality, mostly blue chip dividend stocks, if you actually break it down. So uh, me personally, uh, I always try to have 10% at least in real estate because I don't own any physical real estate. So that's why there's a big portion in RS. Uh, my opinion that, that that's just the best you know option for me in real estate on the Canadian market. It's a split share fund, but it's a collection of top blue chip REITs in Canada and a little bit in the US. So that's my, my real estate go-to. Everything else pretty much holds either a collection of different covered call ETFs, which are either index based or they hold blue chip stocks. Uh, I do have some crypto. My opinion, owning BTCY ETHY is the safest way to actually own crypto because they put covered calls on it. So you're getting a, a little yield. But those two are definitely my biggest underperformers right now uh, in my portfolio, to be honest. But I'm holding them. I continue to get paid. So I'm OK to wait. And I personally have a rule for myself, no more than 10% overall in crypto. And I'm, I'm just about 10% now. So, um, yeah, that, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I unveil my whole, my whole portfolio, even my RSPs every single month on the channel. You could follow along. Uh, you know, this is more geared for income-oriented investors, people who really want to squeeze out as much income as possible. When I started dabbling in dividend stocks, I really fell in love with the idea of that passive income, but I wasn't really happy with four or five or six, and then some dividends would, would get cut. So my, my whole goal was to figure out how to get safely higher, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten percent yields. And that's where, you know, the, the covered call covered call strategy comes in. Not all of them are covered call strategies per se, but I would say most of them here are. Uh, just EIT, I would say, is not really a covered call specific fund, but um, my primary positions would always be in the diversified big ones. And, you know, some, fu some fun stuff I'll always add, like the crypto, maybe the YTSL, which for once in my life, I got good timing. I think I'm like, I put five grand in it and I I'm up to like eight or nine grand, but and 26% yield, which is fun. Um, but I would always focus on the big cap blue chip. Uh, dividend stock stuff. So that is pretty much the spiel. Any any questions? So I'll just make a call out. I notice, you know, compared to, mm -hmm. for example, 
Canadian and t-shirts portfolio, which had 50 different holdings. Yours is pretty streamlined with just 16. And yeah, I used to have like 120, that, by the way. And throughout, throughout the years, I've learned to really streamline. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, I've streamlined my portfolio over, over, over the, the last couple of years. And I, I'm still continuing to do that, although I'm kind of, I'm kind of running out of streamlining availability. But um, yeah, streamlining, make sure you're, you know, a lot of these funds hold, some of them hold hundreds of stocks. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, you might see 16 holdings, but if you really d- do a deep dive, a lot of these, like H Yield, for example, it's thousands of companies. Uh, for sure. In there, you got the Nasdaq well, in- index, S and P five hundred index. Uh, so, um, yeah. W- would it be fair to say, Adrian, that because yeah. HY- HYLD is your top holding at about twenty percent of the portfolio, is that the one you have most confidence in? Is like, in the sense that it's if you had to yeah. pick one core one for, let's say, someone that was interested in I- a higher income, I would say it's a great overall U.S. option. So HYLD, I, I really like it because of the underlying, right? So it, everyone's got to remember HYLD is technically nothing. You got to look at what's inside. It's an ETF that holds many ETFs and it actually holds the top five, or in my opinion, the, the biggest five covered call ETFs on the US market. Mm-hmm. On top of that, it has some gold and it has some healthcare, which kind of adds defense plus a little hedge. Cause usually when, uh, you know, the US economy is very tech heavy, so usually when tech stocks go up, the gold will go down and the opposite is true. So I, I, I really fell in love with the design of the fund. Very, very high yield. Uh, it, it just crossed 14% today because it dropped under $12. Um, but I would say it's a good core fund for sure. Would I make it 100% of my portfolio? Never. Mm-hmm. I would never make anything 100% of my portfolio. Um, but I would say, it, it, you know, HYLD is really designed to be kind of an income version of the S&P 500. Uh, gotcha. And, and HDIV is kind of like the Canadian version of it. So, mm. uh, you know, when, when I tell people who want to start getting into income investing and, and this style of investing, they, they like high passive income. They just, they want to supplement their income. Very popular with the retirees, right? I typically say, you know, start with the broad ones, not really the niche ones. Yeah, uh, because you, you you're more that you're you have automatic diversification, so that's what I would say. Yeah, fair. Let's move along. Let's see. We have Shay coming up next. Hello. Okay. So, um, this is not all of my holdings. I do have um, a separate account with a broker that's not really I cannot really integrate with uh, Blossom yet. That has all my. Uh, index funds. I do like the really boring stuff with like S&P 500, uh, the NASDAQ um, in those index funds. Um, but this connected uh, broker is with my Questrade account. Has It has my TFSA and my RRSP. Um, so I kind of want a mix of growth and dividend um, stocks in my portfolio because eventually I would like to retire and like just live off my dividend payout each month when it's ready. Um, So uh, the way I invest is super simple. I just invest in things that I personally (laughs) use uh, myself. So uh, I've been using Apple products. Um, That's my first stock I've ever ever bought back in 2004. So that's also one of my biggest holdings. Um, Tesla, it's also a stock I really believe in. I've been in it since 20... 2019, um, and then Google, yeah. obviously, with a YouTube uh, channel and with Everyday Office Suite, I use that a lot. Uh, and the rest are just a mix of other things that um, I either invest in for the dividends, um, which some of it is not being shown. Oh, actually, yeah, TD Bank, um, Triple M, um, Johnson & Johnson, super boring stuff. Um, so when so because since I'm mostly a day trader, uh, and I, I trade, I pick individual stocks almost every day when I'm day trading. So that's why for investing, I want to pick stocks that I mo- almost never have to touch. Um, I rarely sell stocks. I almost just add on to them every month or every two months when I see a dip. Um, so yeah, I keep it very simple. I almost never, <laughs> I, I, I n- never like uh, read into the earnings. I just buy it and hold it. 
I almost like forget about them sometimes too. But uh, just to keep my things, my uh, portfolio very simple in the investing space and I never really have to worry about them. I'm, I'm actually thinking of trimming some of the positions because I know while a lot of the presenters before me had tons of stocks, I actually think that for my own investing, even 19 is, you know, 19, mm -hmm, 20 mm -hmm. is too much. Um, so I would like to get rid of a lot of them to trim it down to maybe just 10. Um, I think that would be ideally what I want to aim for. Um, on top of all the other index funds I have with my other account. For sure. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially given that you own the index funds and other accounts. You were saying, so you invest in companies you support and like to use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that, is that the, the Bumble, BMBL? Is that, is that, can, can we find, can we find gonna, you on there? I was going to bring that up. <laughs> so I believe in the, the CEO. Uh, she's a, she's a female and I really believe in her story. She used to work at Tinder and she got booted out. Um, so, and that's where she started Bumble. Um, so I really believe in her. She's, I think the same age as me. Um, so yeah, it was like, mm. someone's going to point that out, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes hey, I, only, I only buy stocks that I use myself. <laughs> There you go. Hey, that's yeah, that's totally. I'm gonna, go that's today, dope, right? swipe. I'm gonna keep swiping until I. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, hey, let's move along. Uh, next up, we have Robin. Oh, right on. So yeah, here's my portfolio. Uh, pretty, I guess, a uh, pretty simple portfolio. Fifteen holdings there. Um, so my portfolio right now is a little bit transitioning things a little bit, but it's more or less kind of the way it is right now. It's going to stay the same more or less. Uh, so the biggest holding is VFB. I love uh, the U.S. stocks. I think it's very smart to hold a lot of U.S. stocks, especially for growth. And I do like to have a lot of growth in my portfolio because I am young. And I like to, you'll see my portfolio is a little bit um, of a mixture of some different things. But I definitely believe in growth, especially right now. Uh, I want to get it up. And we're kind of in a transitionary stage where like over time, like we kind of have like the long term figured out, like we'll be good for retirement and stuff like that. The main goal for like me and my fiance right now is to kind of like, what do we want to do for the next 10, 15, 20 years, right? Um, so we definitely have the growth stuff there. We have BDY, uh, which is just buying into a monthly dividend uh, Canadian stock uh, fund. And then we have some covered call ones. I'm kind of dibbling and dabbling with the covered calls. Again, uh, this is something I learned from watching Adrian's channel. And uh, so I got HYLD and HDIV. I'm going to be adding them. I'm not too sure how much, maybe like a, a small holding 10, 15%. And again, over time, this is going to help us to supplement some income and try to enjoy some of our money as you progress in life and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. So like I said, like we got the long term kind of figured out. But uh, just in case if, you know, as things happen, right, like, you know, um, things become expensive, you have different emergencies that happen in life. You know, how can we make it so that we can deal with those things with a, uh, in a better way kind of thing? And we also kind of want to look towards living more of a part time lifestyle. We definitely kind of tried that out over the past couple of years and it's definitely worked out really well for us. Um, but in terms of our individual stocks and our ETFs, there's definitely a lot of overlap there. And I, I understand that we're trying to focus on eventually over time, fixing some of that stuff. But, you know, I got TD, I love TD, got ATD for growth. Um, you know, Algonquin's in there, which is kind of funny right now. Uh, <laughs> maybe we can have some conversation of what you guys think about Algonquin. Like, are you guys buying or what are you guys doing with that? Uh, I'll just say this. I'll just chime in, Robin. So I get, people commenting because we did purchase Algonquin as well. As I know, I see a lot of people, folks have been. Um, I'm Not to throw anybody under the bus, but that was actually my dad's call. So we even had a little text, uh, text group. Should we buy Algonquin? I said, uh, it wouldn't be my first pick, but we ended up, uh, he kind of vetoed me and, and ended up buying it prior to the drop. So for those of you on my channel who are asking in the comments, do an update video on Algonquin, you're going to ask, you're gonna have to ask Mark for that one because, um, yeah, that's just a quick little chime, chime in there. That was a a number one thing with that, like how so many people have said, don't follow anybody. Like we got <clears throat> so many people emailed us after they had those two big insider buys. The owners bought like three plus million dollars of the company. I think that was at like 1150 and everybody's like, oh, okay, the insiders are buying, we should buy. And yeah, it's, you know, do your own digging. Like oh, sure. don't, yeah. don't follow insider buying either. It's, it's almost just as unreliable, it's, especially insider buying, insider selling, like, there's so many justifications as to why those people could be buying or selling a stock. But yeah, that insider activity was probably the number one reason to not ever blindly follow anybody's decisions. 
What was your general thoughts, Dan, on Algonquin? I feel like you had some to share, uh, at least amongst my community, and I thought they were very good at the time. So, like, there was, like, a very – I actually got in kind of an argument with uh, another popular dividend platform where I thought the dividend was getting cut, and he didn't think the dividend was getting cut. But there was pretty much – there was a lot of warning signs there before. We ended up – it was a pick over at our premium platform, and I think we took it off – like probably in November, maybe September, October, November, that time, just because like rates were going up so fast. And like the company had, you know, almost a quarter of their debt was floating rate. Mm. And you can just see like every quarter, the interest expenses were like rising and rising and rising. And finally it reported, I can't remember, it was a cut right before the dividend and it's interest expenses were like more than double. Mm. And then they lowered guidance, uh, it lowered guidance, which is like kind of a warning sign, but then everybody, they use adjusted funds from operations for a lot of these utilities and the dividend was well covered in that regard. But I mean, then they came out the next quarter and they revised guidance even lower. And it was like a foregone conclusion that the thing was going to get cut, which it was pretty much priced into it, I think, because, you know, mm. right after they lowered the guidance the first time, people knew the dividend cut was uh, coming. But um, yeah, it's like they just got hammered by high rates. They were growing so fast, double digit dividend growth, but then like they kind of funded a lot of their growth on floating rate de debt, especially like their Kentucky power acquisition, which was, mm. they issued shares to fund the Kentucky power acquisition. And then they use those shares to pay down their floating debt. So when they acquire Kentucky power, if they do, they have to pull that all out on variable debt which is like crazy right now. Like the amount of debt those utilities have, like with the rates that are going up, they might continue to go up. It just, it's not good. Like when you compare, say like Fortis, I think Fortis is like four or 5% floating rate debt and Brookfield Renewables is like two or three. So you can just tell like how impacted that company was by uh, floating rate, which they looked absolutely genius when money was free since, you know, the financial crisis. Like they could mm. just fund everything and grow like crazy for a utility, but now it kind of came home to roost. I had it. Uh, I ended up selling it. Uh, I would have sold it right away, but I typically have a, like, I have kind of a guideline after earnings. I wait a week or two. Mm. So I kind of held on to it and it just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And I eventually just sold it. Yeah. I think we're in a similar boat there too. And Robin, to get back to what you were saying, it is a, yeah, a, a less a less certain uh, position, I think, for all of us, uh, for many of the reasons you just stated there, Dan. It's uh, uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't say I'm the most optimistic on this hold, and and yeah, I don't really. It is tough to sell a stock that's gone down, but Algonquin was one of the ones where I mean, I even I have a text thread of my dad. I said, should we should we cut it? And uh, we opted to keep it. Like you said, maybe just give it a bit of more time. But uh, yeah, definitely, thing... definitely not the most op optimistic hold, in my opinion. Hold. The one thing about <laughs> it is. They, the Kentucky power acquisition might not go through. And if it doesn't go through, then the stock is not guaranteed, but it's probably going to see some upside because then they don't have to pull out. They don't have to fund that acquisition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Robin, and, yeah. yeah. Hodl. <laughs> not hold. <hold>, hodl. <laughs> yeah. And thanks for that. Cause that, they, yeah, it's, it's an important thing to point out, you know, um, uh, with those risky stocks, you know, you got to be careful with them. And that's the big reason why I'm a big fan of like the, the ETFs. Like you look at my portfolio with a lot of ETFs because like, you know, if AQN was like 20 or 30% of my portfolio, that'd be a much different story, right? Absolutely. So yeah, I like to kind of keep them on the lower side. Um, and yeah, the other stocks I have are mostly just um, dividend focused with growth. I like to have the combination of the two. And one thing I would like to ask, actually, while we're kind of doing this is, uh, I know Adrian talked about his portfolio uh, from PII. Um, I'm kind of going into those covered calls. Like, what do you think, looking at my portfolio, do you think that HYLD and HDIV, does that make sense in there? Yeah, of course. It, th those are income generators, right? So it, it's like you said before, you, you realize that in case something happens, you want a source of consistent high income. Uh, they work especially well in your TFSA, especially H yield because it's more U.S. focused. So there's a bit of there's a bit more foreign income there. Um, so th they're really fantastic things for for your TFSA to just you know get that cash flow. If you don't really need it, you could always reinvest it. You could drip it. It's uh, I see you. You're maybe doing a combination of dividend growth and covered calls. I, I think covered calls is just an extra step on top of the dividend growth style. It, it's actually, they're not that far apart, right? Uh, yeah. So yeah. 
uh, I think it's a good idea. I mean, to have some, it all depends what you want, right? Yeah. I, I say this all the time. I'm not against any style of investing. I think everything works well long-term as long as you're investing in quality. But, you know, the Algonquin thing, you know, it, it blew up on my Facebook group as well. This is exactly why I, I stopped investing in like single companies a, a long time ago, just because mm -hmm. I just don't want that hassle. I don't want I don't want to spend my time looking uh, at the, the the quarterly reports. I have no idea what I'm looking at anyway. You know, maybe someone like Dan is an expert in that. And that's cool if you really like it. But I it's not like I like it. So I say, you know, go super, super broad. You add cover calls to anything you're lowering your risk. It, it, you, your, your, your income is very secure. Yes, over time in a bull market, they don't do well, but I, they do fairly well in a flat or a down market because that income is always, you know, guaranteed. So Robin, you no, know, if I were you, I'm just, I'm just, I'm not telling you anything. I'm just, um, you know, you have a lot of stocks like the, the Manulife one, the Fortis, Pow, which I'm sure are all in VDY. So yeah, another Yeah, there thing, is overlap there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And VDY is, you know, I, I, after looking at all of them, I think it's the best Canadian dividend one compared to the BMO one compared to the iShares one. So, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, personally, I would never own single stocks. The only single stock that I kind of have is Enbridge and the Tesla one, but they're in a covered call format. So even if they go down or, you know, Enbridge dividend get, gets cut, Tesla's doesn't have a dividend you still have that that covered call income which helps it always gives you that consistency so right on thanks for that i appreciate that very much sure. and uh no i and uh you know like i do like to keep it simple like shay mentioned i like to kind of just go in every day and just i can feel comfortable buying whatever i have and uh yeah i, I don't really care about freaking out about things so i just like to keep things simple yeah. and make it as easy as possible yeah my yeah. first thinking instinct when i saw that and the big drop is now is a great time to buy aqn no, I'm yeah. always opportunistic. So I don't know about you guys. I was going to ask you guys, did you guys buy it when there was that big dip or? I'm putting in like a tiny little bit every single time I go to buy something. It's like a share or two, you know? Yeah. Because they're still I'm getting a dividend, right? right? It's not like they canceled yeah. it. Yeah. No, they right? did. They so, cut it. Yeah, it is utility. So I, I was, in, I was unfortunately in before that. So yeah, but. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah. risk. It's single stocks is always a bit risky. Yeah, for sure. With that. For sure. And I think that's one thing too, that uh, yeah, hopefully we're displaying thus far in the collab is like, everyone's got their own style, some single stocks, some ETFs. Rob and I do think that you do display a really good portfolio for, for the masses. You know, it's a good one to model off of. And, and like you said, Adrian, it's a good call out that yeah, maybe there is overlap with a couple holdings. Again, I don't really see an issue with that um, in that, hey, if you are optimistic for certain individual holds they don't yeah. like you said they don't uh you know make a huge part of your portfolio robin they're just you know very an ancillary but um i i do very like the simplicity aspect of this and i think it's a it's a good one to model off for a lot of people thanks yeah, if i if i could jump in real quick just about that overlap comment yeah like this is a question i get all the time like in instagram youtube comments whatever like is it okay to overlap is it okay to have an etf and also invest in yeah, the stocks same. within it right totally fine right as long as you're aware of that overlap right because mm -hmm. because the your true exposure in a sector or a particular company may be much higher than you really think it is because of that overlap with etfs but right. as long as you're aware of that it's totally fine like you know you invest in the in the in, in s p 500 right you're still allowed to invest in facebook in google and microsoft right you're kind of doubling down on those gems within the etf that you really think have a good future and that's totally fine as long as you're aware of it, right? Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. I think that's a good way. I think that's a really good way of uh, putting it. Dan, looks like you're up next. And I believe we have uh, Riley Cass and uh, Bilal. And then we can, uh, yeah, move along. Yeah. So this, <clears throat> uh, this actually isn't uh, my portfolio. It's like I do own all these, but it's one of our models. So again, just like Shay, I'm with a platform that really doesn't integrate well with Blossom yet. So uh, I ended up taking my Wellsible account and hooked it up here uh, just because the trades are automatically done and all that kind of stuff. So uh, for the most part, this is one of the dividend growth models we have. Um, last year, we did uh, just like a back test study over the past 10 years, compared uh, the highest yielding Canadian dividend stocks and compared them to just low yielding, high growth companies and just found that 
in terms of overall performance, it just absolutely crushed them. Like I think by almost double um, most of these companies in here, I think it was almost 21% annualized over the last 10 years. And it's pretty crazy because it contained, you know, companies like Loblaws, like Kushtard, uh, TMX Group, I think was in there. TFI International was in there. So it's not necessarily small cap stocks. These were big companies that put up huge performances. So there was a lot of popularity to kind of create a model portfolio around those. And that's kind of how we got to here and just kind of put my money where my mouth is. I just bought the whole portfolio as soon as we released it. Um, that's the number one thing Well Simple was good for too, is kind of the fractional ownership. Um, these three stocks, Aritzia, Park Lawn, and TELUS International, those are not in the model. Those I just bought in the personal account on there just because I've started to contribute to Wellsimple over Qtrade just because I kind of like the platform more now. But uh, for the most part, these are going to be companies that are growing the dividend at a double digit pace and they have uh, double digit returns on capital. So essentially how efficient are they at taking debt, taking equity and uh, turning it into profit? So... Uh, it's equal weight for the most part, but we tend to have like core holdings like uh, Granite Reed, Brookfield, uh, Apple, Canadian National Railway, Home Depot, TELUS, Microsoft. So we would opt for, in this situation, I would opt for a company like TELUS over something like BCE just because of the overall growth of the company. Uh, TELUS, you know, they're into healthcare, they're into telehealth. Uh, they just spun off. Tixty, which is TELUS International, which is like IT uh, customer service type stuff. Whereas, you know, Bell is a little bit slower company, higher yielding, but, you know, they're into, you know, sports franchises, media, like lower margin businesses. Um, I'm not sure what else to say about this portfolio. I mean, it's got some really tiny companies, like unknown companies in here, TMX Group, Jameson Wellness. Uh Jamieson Wellness is actually a very interesting company. They're growing crazy fast with Costco. Uh, and the, as the medicine, Costco, they, they make the supplements, right? I think I've seen them. Yeah. yeah. I've yeah. seen them also. So like they're growing at a really fast pace and especially their agreement with Costco uh, in terms of like growth in China, it could like, that's pretty much the backbone thesis of owning Jamieson Wellness is the growth in China. Um, and the market hasn't really valued this much yet in our opinion. So that's why we have it in here. And that's why I own it myself. Um, but just in terms of like why something else over the other, I mean, intact financial over, you know, a PNC insurer, like intact financial, the PNC market is so fragmented. Like there's so many property and casualty insurers. Intact financial is like one of the biggest in North America and they only have, you know, 17% market share. So just the growth that they experience is why like I own intact over something like Manulife or Great West Life, like life insurers, you know, I like the companies that sell auto insurance, home insurance over things like annuities, uh, life insurance policies, stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, most of these kind of speak to themselves. I mean, Kushtard is just unbelievable. The amount they've been able to grow comparing their size. Yeah. Um, it just seems like they're unstoppable. They have probably one of the best management teams in North America for a company its size to just grow the way it does, especially during the pandemic. And even, you know, the bear case with Kushtard is typically EVs, but they're already rolling. They were char They were testing EV stations like five years ago in Norway. So they're start they've already started rolling them out in North America, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really have too much else to say about this. My portfolio overall, my strategy overall is just a total return strategy. And I'll mostly do this by just the same thing. I identify companies with growing earnings, strong returns on capital. Um, for the most part, you know, that's like 90% of my portfolio. Um, on the more speculative side, like I do own more speculative companies. Um, well, like let's say Shopify, um, I own a few very small cap companies, um, but things like Shopify, Lightspeed, I ended up moving on from Shopify, but uh, I mean, I own the psychedelic ETF that owns a lot of the, you know, the mind medicines and new me wellness. Like they're very, very small portions of my portfolio. Uh, most of the time, no holding will 
ever make up more than four and a half, five percent, or else I'll typically rebalance it downwards. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I wish I could add my full portfolio on here, but it's just sometimes it's uh, it's Coming tough for soon. me to yeah, it's just tough for me to maintain the manual transactions and stuff like that. So absolutely, yeah, and that's something Max. I know they're working hard behind the scenes to to open that up. And uh, trust me, they're they're working hard on that. So the fact that you're able to at least share this model portfolio, I think, is a is a blessing, Dan. So no, thank you for going over that. I think we have a couple more. Bilal, I'm going to send over to you. I have to go to the washroom extremely bad, so I hope we don't have to do too much here. But I'm going to le- leave it like this, and uh, yeah, Bilal, take it away. Okay, what's up, guys? Uh, this is my portfolio, 26 holdings. I kind of have more of a hybrid type of investing where. I'm into dividend stocks, growth stocks, passive income stocks, and then I have my speculative plays too. So kind of like, but the speculative plays are kind of like the 100 bagger attempts, you know, very small portion of my portfolio, but I'm only 26 years old, so I am taking a risk with growth stocks and my speculative plays. So my largest holding is Smart Centers. I really like their concept, you know, it's more of a very great dividend payer. 7% 7% on a monthly month basis. And also they're, you know, Walmart's like taking over Canada. So that's why I kind of like smart centers. And my second largest holding is Google. You know, uh, Google takes over, you know, it's, it takes over the internet and the internet pretty much takes over everyone else. Cause you know, internet's not going anywhere and Google's kind of like the main boss. And then my third play I got is DFN. And I kind of like that stock because it's a monthly uh, dividend payer. And I really like the whole idea of passive income, like uh, Adrian always talks about. And, you know, I also like my other dividend stocks. You know, I got Enbridge, Bank of Nova Scotia. So those are just my Canadian blue chips. And then uh, my fourth largest holding is uh, VSP. That's kind of a Canadian hedge version of the S&P 500. And, uh, you know, that's a no-brainer investment. And that's just something I buy every week without me even thinking. I have it kind of on a recurring uh, thing on What Simple Trade. And then my fifth play is actually uh, it's a little uh, it's a little risky. It's called HQU, which is a times two leverage version of Nasdaq. I kind of bought that when the market started dipping, and you know it's I don't know when the market's gonna recover, but we all know the market's gonna eventually recover. And you know Nasdaq kind of took a hit, so it's like a times two bet that Nasdaq's gonna recover. It's kind of down right now, but lately the last couple of months it's been going up and. You know, once the Nasdaq recovers, I should be uh, paid very well from that ETF. And then uh, I got Airbnb. That's kind of my niche because I I travel, right? So I kind of see where everyone's going. I just came back from Thailand like last week. So majority of the people that were in Thailand, they're all staying in Airbnb villas. And uh, uh, just a couple of days ago, Airbnb just reported killer earnings because, uh, you know, the whole travel travel boom has started since uh, the pandemic. But, uh, and then the next holding I have is ChargePoint. This is the ChargePoint Chargers. It's one of my speculative plays. I'm kind of overly invested, I'd say. I want to trim that position down. But I am confident. uh, One of my businesses, uh, we work with ChargePoint, installing the chargers and whatnot. And I know there's a huge demand with ChargePoint Chargers. So I'm kind of like, it's kind of like insider info. So I'm kind of confident. And then uh, the the next one I'm going to talk about is Pizza Pizza. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about Pizza Pizza, but in Ontario and Toronto, it's one of the main pizza restaurants. And I think it's somewhere in Canada, should be around Canada too, but it pays a great dividend. You know, I get about like 20 bucks in dividends every month. So I kind of like to say I'm going to use those dividends towards an extra large pizza every month. (laughs) But uh, yeah, that's pretty much my portfolio. Everything else is, uh, you know, I I do want to... Uh, trim this portfolio down to maybe like 15 to 20 positions but some of the plays i have here are just for recovery like meaning since they're all on a, they're all on sale i think they're on sale so i'm just taking advantage of it like uh apple even bank of nova scotia i don't really like investing with the banks you know but uh, uh bank of nova scotia is pretty cheap so i took advantage of that and then uh tsm but it sucks that Buffett just sold. So I'm kind of like, what was going on over here? But I'm going to hold because uh, I do have faith in uh, China and Taiwan to be like, um, you know, the emerging markets. I think they're going to take over. They have a chance to be one of the dominant players. So I even followed uh, uh, Brandon by buying Baba. And, you know, I looked into Alibaba. It's pretty great stock. 
And uh, when I went to Turkey, I bought this small stock here, here called uh, Turkicell. And, you know, Turkey is actually, a, even though they have high inflation, they do have uh, a lot of great companies that are undervalued. So kind of taking a bet on uh, Turkey too. And sucks that they had an earthquake, but the stock has, uh, you know, it's kind of recovered. So I bought the dip and, you know, it's not bad, you know, to sometimes take advantage of uh, disasters, even though it sounds bad, but you guys stay optimistic. And yeah, that's pretty much my portfolio. Yeah, you guys have any questions or, you know, if you guys have any uh, opinions on my portfolio, let me hear it. Kind of, I am kind of a little risky, but you know, I'm only 26 years old. So, you know, I take, uh, <laughs> I take what I can. <laughs> I, I'd like to ask you, uh, you said you don't like to invest in the banks. Why is that so? Uh, you know, I just feel like uh, the banks are, it's, I, it's just like, it's they're one of the best, like <laughs> the main guys in Canada. And also they do have a, a lot of debt and stuff. And I just, I'm, I, I like to wear a tinfoil hat. I'm, I'm a conspiracy theorist <laughs> where I think the banks are eventually going to fail because, you know, they can only, <laughs> they can, they can only hold so much debt for so long. Right. But, uh. It could be, you could, it, it is debatable. And you know, the whole conspiracy about one world government, one currency. And yeah, I do invest in crypto. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> You're ready for that, eh, Robin? Yeah. Definitely, that's definitely debatable, Bilal. But we, maybe we'll leave it at that. <laughs> hey, hey, look, I still, I still, I still own it. But I'm just saying I'm not going to hold on to bank stocks forever. You know what I mean? The yeah. fair. And yeah. I will, ju- I will just chime in as kind of the host here. We are going quite a while. And I know, um, in all honesty, you guys are probably busy days and schedules. Cash, you've been sitting there for in the sun for however long, just <laughs> quiet. So nice tan guys. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, just in lieu of time, we probably, uh, unfortunately may have to push the, the Q and a segment. Um, I think that just makes sense. I mean, unless you guys only sit in here for hours, but I do know a lot of you guys have to run and Hey, maybe that means there's a part two to this where we just answer questions from the viewers, but we do have two more and Cassie you've been patiently waiting. So, um, we'll send it off to you and, uh, give me a second. Oh, I didn't know we could do this mode. This one looks kind of cool too, actually. Oh, this is way better. This does look pretty cool. It does cut off a little bit, but Cass have at it. Okay. So this is my portfolio guys. This is pretty much 99% of what I of my portfolio like uh, i'm not i wasn't able to transfer i think one nasdaq and one td index fund uh so besides that this is pretty much exactly what my portfolio is this is my tfsa my rsp and a non-registered with quest trade so this is everything and um so my biggest position here is hxq so the nasdaq 100 i do have a little bit of tesla apple disney those were actually my first three investments that i made probably about two and a half almost three years ago uh, I'm at, like, I am a little bit, I would consider medium to high risk. I do have a little bit of arc, which is absolutely killing me right now. It's like down 60% or something like that. Crazy. I don't even look at it, but I do hold things like arc. I have three different arc ETFs. I have a little bit of Palantir. We'll see how that goes long-term. Um, but overall, like I do have some individual stocks. I kind of want to pump the brakes on buying individual stocks this year. And I want to focus more on my predominantly NASDAQ 100 ETF, HXQ. And uh, overall, I'm very much uh, buy and hold forever, as someone else mentioned. Very rarely am I ever looking at my actual portfolio. Very rarely am I ever am I actually selling. I'm never withdrawing from my account, but I'm I'm also very rarely selling at all. Maybe I have some positions like that I might want to trim down or eliminate altogether. Something like Carnival, which I bought maybe about two years ago when I was super new. I'm not really committed to Carnival. I'm sure they're great. I go on cruises sometimes, but. So something like that, maybe I would sell and put more into HXQ, my NASDAQ 100. What about uh, the Tattooed Chef? Oh my God, don't even get me started on that. I literally <laughs> made, a, made a, uh, a post on Blossom a couple of days ago being like, what's your most stupidest mistake? And this is my stupidest mistake, guys. Like, I have my brother who watches all the financial YouTubers. Finan- you guys probably, you we guys know, yeah. know the one I'm talking Jeremy. about. Yeah. I hate him, but, but he, and he was, and my brother, uh, he... He goes into depth in, into individual companies. He looks at the balance sheet. I don't do any of that. I'm really not interested in doing that. So I like more like well-established companies like Apple, Disney, or just buying ETF, right? Low maintenance. But he was very much into the company balance sheets and everything. And and he's like, and he didn't tell me to invest. I take the responsibility here. So I, I do have a couple thousand in TTCF and I'm down like 90%. It's not cute. You blindly but, trusted him. It's it's a good lesson, I guess we can all say. It's a yeah. it's something and you probably won't forget. We've all been and, there. Yeah, <laughs> and like luckily I have a large emergency fund, so I'm very much of the ethos of all the money that I invest, I 
I mentally think of it as I spent it. I'm not allowed to touch it. So for me, it doesn't keep me up at night because I am, you know, long-term investing and I have a very long-term time horizon. My risk tolerance is a little bit high, so it doesn't keep me up at night at all. But it just it just goes to show, like, don't be investing in stocks that have a lot of hype or or don't invest in, in things that you don't believe in, right? And so that was definitely a lesson for me. And like I mentioned before, I just want to take a backseat on individual stocks this year, probably, and just focus more on ETFs. I want to use most of my TFSA contribution, which is 6,500, I believe, this year, mostly into the NASDAQ 100. Mm. And yeah, I'm just pretty much a boring buy and hold investor. Like I mentioned, I'm very rarely looking looking at my accounts. And I just hope to build like a big nest egg of at least 1.5 million, maybe one day to retire off of and maybe withdraw 4%, like the 4% rule. And so that's pretty much my goal. Yeah, that sums it up. Absolutely. Well, hey, unless anyone has any thoughts, we can move over to our final portfolio here. Um, I, I just Riley. got a couple of things, Brandon, two, two seconds. Uh, HXQ, I really like that one because it's actually the Canadian listed NASDAQ with the lowest MER. I'm yeah. sure, Cass, you, you, you saw that compared to the BMO one. Second thing I'm going to tell you, since you like the ARC or love, hate it, there's this crazy <laughs> thing that just came out on the U.S. market called the stock symbol is OARC. O-A-R-K. I've heard and about these this. guys, you heard about it? But continue on because I don't know too much about it. Yeah. So they do. This This was even a shocker for me. I had to like see what read the prospectus to see what the heck this is about. They do synthetic covered calls on it. And only two dividends have come out, and it looks like it's going to be like 50 to 60% yield <laughs> annually. So it, it basically, it's pretty crazy. So if, if ever you want to, the strategy with this is to capitalize on the volatility of an ARC. Or they also have a Tesla one too, 50, 60% yield. Uh, pretty crazy stuff. A bit similar to the Purpose ETF yield share I'll that just came out. Uh, but this is on the U.S. market from this company <laughs> called Yieldmax. So yeah, pretty I'll, crazy. I'll, I'll, ch I'll, ch I'll chime in, Adrian. I, I can get behind, uh, you know, the covered call strategies, um, you know, on the big blue chip holds, the HYLDs. But uh, I don't know if I can get behind oh, the ARC <laughs> plus the covered call. To me, that's that's my no-go zone. But hey, that's uh, to each their own, right? I'm sure you did your research. I'm not trying to discredit that. But uh, well, I'm ARC just saying is, that you know, ARC is definitely not a blue chip, right? But it is an ETF that holds a bunch of, you know, innovation yeah. whatever all kinds of stuff i'll just say i, I, trust, I think i don't trust kathy would no more i don't I even know. I, I i wouldn't you know i i don't think it's uh, i'm not as polarized as as many are i think uh you know a big misconception people have with the arc etf is they you know expect that to be their portfolio if you will like hey that's what i'm investing in and i don't think that was ever the intention uh, if you actually understand her her strategy from what i understand um she has to be fully invested like if you look at the the guidelines of her fund, um, her goal is to be fully invested whether market's going up or down in this innovative tech. And that therefore then can play a role in your portfolio, like in your case, CAS may be making up a percentage, but it was never intended to be an entire portfolio mix. It was intended to be a piece of the pie. And I, from my understanding, she is constrained to her strategy. That's what they do. And I think it's funny how fast that narrative can flip. Uh, I also, I didn't think she was a genius when Tesla did very well. And I also don't think she's a, uh, you know, the worst investor ever now that the market's taking a turn. But those are my two cents on the, the ARK ETFs. Yeah, and you know, I'm probably not the most wise investor in that. I don't, I didn't research deeply into ARK. I don't regret the position at all. I just truly thought it was so cool. Like, I love innovation and tech. So that's why the NASDAQ is a little bit more on the safer side, although it still is medium to high risk. But ARK is, you know, something that I want to kind of play around. Like, that's, that's like one of my fun investments, right? And so no regrets there. I'm I'm prepared to hold it for the long term, and as I do with most of my investments, and in Kathy, we trust, I guess. <laughs> Yikes. Okay, let's move along. Uh, finally, um, Riley, take it away. All right. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, last but not least, uh, you can see the uh, the symbol there, the Monopoly man's back. So um, in life, basically, my investing strategy is I like to dump things down just with kind of everything in life. I'll keep it sweet and simple for you guys. A lot of the things that I kind of do have been mentioned with previous people. Um, but like I said, I like to dumb things down, keep things simple. Uh, my favorite investing quote, I know Adrian mentioned uh, an investing quote earlier is uh, time in the market 
beats timing the market. And I completely believe in that moving forward. Uh, my investing strategy is long-term growth dividend investing in companies that I personally believe in long-term. Um, my portfolio, as you can see, kind of consists of broad-based ETFs as well as kind of individual companies, like I mentioned. Uh, I'm basically dollar cost averaging, like I mentioned before, on a weekly basis. Uh, so my portfolio is kind of broken into two different sections. I have my uh, core ETFs or my broad-based ETFs that I hold. As you can see, uh, VFV kind of follows the S&P 500. VDY, a great high yield index fund um, that holds a lot of Canadian companies as well. And then QQC.F, which kind of follows the NASDAQ. Uh, so that's kind of 70% of my portfolio. And then the other 30% being kind of individual stocks that I believe in long term. And I know we were talking about before kind of holding companies that also are in ETFs. And again, like I mentioned, these are companies that I believe in long term that I use personally. And I wanted to increase the position of my whole holding in these specific companies. So that's kind of where I sit. Uh, keep it nice and simple. Again, like I said, a lot of the things that I follow and believe in were mentioned before. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank you guys again for, for having me on here and uh, uh, I continue to dollar cost average on a weekly basis following my uh, YouTube channel. And I was a little bit late to the investing. Um, I had to pay down a lot of debt and that could be another whole conversation and, and, and topic, but I like to have uh, uh, my debt paid down before investing into something like stocks where I have uh, maybe a little bit more yield uh, available to me. Yeah, well, I'll just say this. I, first and foremost, I do agree with what Adriana said yesterday with that you do have a earlier, you said you have a very, very nice speaking voice. And I think that's um, just one thing <laughs> that I think is that remains true. Um, and I do very much like like the portfolio, Riley. I mean, I, I guess in some summary, like I said, we'll push the Q&A to possibly another time if we can manage to line this all up again, guys, because um, it is very difficult. And especially, yeah, I, I do appreciate it. But, uh, you know, I specifically look at a portfolio like Robbins or, or Riley's. Um, the, the, they're simple portfolios relative to the rest of us, but I do think that they demonstrate a really, a really foundationally strong way to invest. And like you know, looking at Cas portfolio, my portfolio, um, you know, all of us, but all we we all make these mistakes with individual stocks, and we have these learning lessons. And for a lot of people, um, it, what I'm trying to get at is that I like the fact that you guys kind of. Um, to me, it's a good role model to keep it simple. Uh, it's a good example for, for the masses out there because, um, like you said, it's hard to argue with what you guys have said there. I know, Dan, maybe you have some thoughts to chime in. You you primarily own individual stocks. Uh, Adrian clearly owned a, a healthy number of diversified at stocks. Um, what, what do you guys think of that, uh, kind of that, that summary that I just gave there? Dan, you want to take that? Or, or I could jump in. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So, so basically, I'll comment I, after. Sure, there you go. Yeah. So I, I definitely agree with what Brand's saying, and and the idea of like, especially if you're a beginner investor, simplicity mm -hmm. is 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 fine. Like that simplicity is not bad. Simple is mm -hmm. good because you want to know where your money's going, right? If you blindly invest like a Spitfire approach into fifty companies as a beginner, there's no way you're going to understand the fundamental metrics of those 50 companies, right? So it's much easier and much safer. And like, historically speaking, there's studies to prove this. If you focus on like, you know, broad index ETFs, or maybe a handful of companies that are diversified across different sectors, and you can kind of, you know, dive into the fundamentals of each of those. That's great. Like if you have 10 holdings, 20, 20 holdings, that's fine. As an example of me and probably some of the other people here, um, we've probably been investing for, you know, almost 10 years, right? So for example, and I'll speak for myself, I have, you can see on my boss, I'm probably around 50, 50 holdings, right? I did not do that in a year or two. That took, that that was over the course of like 10 years, right? If, mm -hmm. if I just started investing two years ago, I probably would only have maybe 15, 12, 12 holdings, something like that. So simplicity is always good, whether you're an experienced investor or a new investor, right? It's about knowing what you're doing, not just, it's about having a strategy, knowing where your money's going, having faith in the companies you own. And, and I think that's, that's the most important thing. And kind of the something that, that Shay mentioned. Um, and I think, I think uh, Bilal mentioned as well, right? It's fine. Another strategy is, that's simple, but works is invest where you spend money, right? If you, if you spend a lot of money at, at pizza, pizza, you spend a lot of money at Starbucks, Aritzia, Apple, whatever, 
chances are millions of other people do too, right? Uh, so that can be, that's not, that shouldn't be the only metric on how to choose a stock, but it could be a way to kind of filter stocks. Like, okay, if, if I'm thinking of a company to invest in, I spend every day money on my, my cell phone bill, my internet bill, my, uh, whatever, my car insurance, whatever. So think about that. That could be a way to kind of, you know, filter out what companies might I want to invest in. And you kind of get a bit of a psychological boost when you own a company and you spend money there. It might be silly, but like, I get that too. Like, I feel like, Hey, you know what? I'm an owner of this place. So when I'm paying my money, I'm getting a piece of that back because I own a share of that company. Right? So long story short, I would say simplicity is definitely fine. Um, it's not something to be discouraged. It's not simplicity. doesn't mean like you're branded as a, as a noob or a beginner. Some of the most well successful investors of all time have very simple portfolios, right? Mm -hmm. That's totally fine. That's not something to shy away from. Yeah, not much ad. I guess <clears throat> the number one thing I was just thinking, like, you know, that don't do this if you shop at Bed Bath and Beyond a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I saw I saw you smirking yeah. and that was yeah, that's that was like, very yes. That strategy <laughs> does not work all the time. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much Absolutely. like <laughs> if you have if you have the time to keep track of 20 stocks and own 20 stocks, but if you find yourself if you find yourself owning holdings and not looking at them, it's probably a sign that you own too many holdings. Like if you have, you know, if you have time to keep track of 25, 30 equities, like I think I hold, I think I hold close to 40 positions, not including that model. I just held that. Yeah. I bought it just for that reason. Like I kind of keep that aside, but I think I have 37 or 38 holdings, but like I'm doing this all day. If you that's have the nine, that's the key difference. Yeah. That, that's, that's the key difference then. Sorry to cut you off. And it's like, you know, you not to, to categorize certain people, but like even in your introductions, you know, a couple of you guys are saying, hey, I'm just your average person. I'm just your normal person. I work my nine to five. I do nursing. I do this. Um, that's different from what you do, Dan, where you your job is to research stocks and manage yeah, a portfolio. Like, it, it is a different. So, yeah, that, that's that's a very there fair are call out. some companies like there's some companies in my portfolio that I have not looked at in a very long time. Like I haven't looked into a Fortis quarterly report. Yeah. in a very long time because it just does its thing. But like, if you have a lot of companies that you got to keep tabs on, ultimately, you know, if you're only spending maybe an hour a week, maybe you shouldn't own 25, 30 companies. Maybe you should trim it down and own 10 or 15. Or like, if you find you have absolutely no time, just index mm -hmm. pretty much. That's very fair. I think uh, just to just to double back on that quick, just another comment to make. Um, I think at the end of the day, a uh, big thing is diversification is key too. And I feel like with me and maybe Robin can say the same, or I know he has a little bit more capital invested, but I find when I was starting to get more diversification, I found it easier to invest in something like an ETF. Um, that's just kind of where I'm coming from. Absolutely. that That is a big thing. You, you're starting with a hundred bucks or 500 bucks. Very well, I guess you do a fractional trading now, but uh, yeah, it's that is a very logical path to start with, and then with time, uh, maybe add some individual holdings. Well, hey guys, um, just like I said, in lieu of time, we really should wrap up because we've been going for a while, and it's lunchtime here for us in Vancouver on the, the west coast. And yeah, if anybody has any concluding thoughts or anything, um, feel free to chime in. I'll just say, like, it's uh, this is the first ever kind of big collab like this I've ever done. Um, I've historically kind of been opposed to things like this. I'm not the biggest people person kind of thing, but uh, I, I, I do enjoy this with you guys. Um, each and every one of you have got the chance to meet and I would call my friend now uh, over the internet, some of you guys in person. And uh, it's it's just really special. And I do think that the, the viewers, it's cool to be able to get us all, like, you know, maybe they follow a couple of us or they've seen us here. Uh, I think it's very special to have us all in one, one, one big place. And um, it means a lot to me that you guys all took time out of your day to do this, so. That would be my Thanks for having concluding. Us, Brandon. Thanks for arranging You're, all this. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, we could do You're it again. Welcome. No problem. Next time, take Definitely. some questions. Maybe get prepared in advance. If anyone has specific questions for certain people, uh, we could do that too. It would be a good idea since we all kind of have different styles of investing too, which is cool. For sure. And I'll just say to, you know, not to the, you know, forget about the people. We did have a lot of great suggestions on Blossom. Um, shout out to you guys. If you left these ones, we were going to ask uh, a variety of them. But like I said, in because of the time, it just um, doesn't make sense right now. But definitely some good questions that we can maybe roll over into the next uh, session. But yeah, with that, um, I mean, I'll be sure as I post this on my channel to link all of you guys' stuff down below. Um, a lot of you guys, yeah, have got the chance to, you know, talk about your, your channels or whatnot. But um, for the viewers at home, 
take a moment, do some digging, give some follows. Obviously, we are all on Blossom, which is uh, basically the premise of, of kind of the, the center point of where we are here today. It's a really special app, in my opinion, and I think it's really making some headway. So it's cool to have you guys all on board, and uh, I guess with that, we can we can wrap it up. Have a good weekend, guys. Thanks, Brandon. Awesome. Appreciate Thanks, it. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> it was awesome. I'll see you, I'll see you guys. Take care. All right, see ya. I'm not leaving.